UAE in association with Emirates Speciality Hospital and Quetabiotics in KZ. The topic of the um, webinar today is like neonatal neurology and a galaxy of speakers have been arranged from the neonatal uh, uh, neonatal uh, team of uh, UAE, along with the help of uh, Dr. Amit Mathur. So let me just introduce the scientific committee of today's uh, uh, program. So Dr. Monica Koshal, so she is the consultant neonatologist and head at Emirates Specialty Hospital at Dubai Healthcare City. Dr. Rajesh Sharma, consultant neonatologist at Al Cornish Hospital, Abu Dhabi and Dr. Sridhar Kalyan Sundaram, Head of Neonatology and Consultant Neonatology mm -hmm. at Dhanat Amra, the Emirates Hospital, Abu Dhabi. Along with, we are very grateful to Dr. Amit Mathur for his uh, uh, coordination with all the speakers to arrange for today's program. Dr. Amit Mathur is a professor and director and division of neonatal perinatal medicine and Department of Pediatrics, St. Louis University <laughs> School of Medicine and he is medical director at NICU, SSM Health Cardinal Glennon at Children's Hospital, Missouri, United States. Myself, Taufik Ali, I'm a country business manager of uh, New Country Healthcare. So I request like Dr. Sridhar to come on and give the introduction speech. Thank you. Dr. Sridhar, please. Yes. Thank you and uh, good evening, everyone. And welcome to join us for this uh, ex excellent symposium uh, on neonatal neurology. Uh, the National Neonatology Forum uh, is well established in service for the newborn and uh, along with the Indian Academy of Pediatrics uh, neonatal chapter, both are doing a great job in furthering neonatal care all over the country. And we are very privileged to have uh, Professor uh, Siddharth Ramji here with us who is now taken over as the president from none other than Professor Ashok Deorari. And uh, next year, it will be my uh, privilege for Professor Praveen Kumar as well. So we are privileged to have such excellent academicians leading the NNF. And we will be uh, going through, I'm sure, a lot of uh, improvements in the way we are delivering uh, neonatal care in India. This uh, webinar has been organized with great support uh, from uh, uh, Amit uh, Mathur. And uh, we are privileged to have his support. And the faculty today, all of you must have seen, uh, is an amazing uh, faculty, uh, all of them extremely experienced in the field and the topics are very interesting, ranging from neurodevelopment in premature babies, perinatal asphyxia, neonatal seizures and outcome in term babies. And uh, I'm sure we'll have an excellent session with discussion. Uh, in terms of housekeeping, I mean, uh, we need to put the questions in the session for the sessions because the discussion will happen soon after the individual lectures. And if any questions are addressed and uh, by typing the answers, we will do that. And if there is time uh, for the questions in the discussion session, we'll cover that as well. We expect more than 1,000 uh, attendees and hopefully we'll have a great session. Now, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Siddharth Ramji. All of you know him. He is an eminent academician. He was the Dean of Maula Nazad Medical College uh, for three years before retiring and he's the current uh, NNF uh, president. And he has an excellent career. All of you know his uh, landmark work on oxygen at resuscitation or room air at resuscitation rather than oxygen at resuscitation. So uh, I'm not going to go into much detail on introducing him because he's an extremely renowned, well-known figure all over India. And we request him, uh, we thank him firstly for uh, honoring us with this presence today. And we request him to offer a few words uh, before the webinar. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Sridhar, for those very kind words and uh, a good day to all of you. Um, you know, I know I realize that you people are here on this platform across several time zones. So uh, I couldn't find a more appropriate way of greeting everyone. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank all of you for <clears throat> having us over here. I'm particularly very honored <clears throat> to be part of the rather exciting symposia that you put together. It's exciting, I think, for, for more than one reason. As you said right at the outset, uh, we have some of the best minds in neonatal neurology uh, who are going to speak this evening. And I don't think it's often uh, 
an opportunity that one gets to hear these great minds. Not only that, I think uh, you people have done a great job uh, allowing over a thousand people, I understand a thousand participants, who would get some kind of an opportunity to actually interact with these people. Um, we have all been transiting through <clears throat> improved newborn survival um, and also the period of viability has been progressively coming down further and further down. And so I think the main concern that all of us eventually have is that we want our kids to be, have, be intact in terms of cognition and maximize the adult outputs. And nothing could be more important than looking at the neurology of these kids. And I think that the participants today will have much to learn from these wonderful legends. And I'm sure that each one of them would have an opportunity to take back important lessons that they can take back into their own personal practice and hope to do something better for the babies they salvage. So thank you so much for having me over, wishing you all the best. And I would like to stand between this wonderful symposia and the participants. Thank you all of you. Thank you, sir, for your kind blessings. And you said it very clearly that we uh, sow the seeds for the future and anything that happens with the brain has an impact on their whole life more than any other organ system. So without doubt, this is one area that affects the parents, affects the uh, NICU team and whatever we do from the start, we have to do it in the best way possible to protect the brain. So neuroprotection is the key. And now I'll move on to Professor uh, Amit Mathur who will have, I mean, he has had a huge role in organizing as Taufik mentioned and without him, I don't think we would have coordinated so well. And uh, he and Monica did a great job in getting together our galaxy of speakers. Uh, he did his medical training uh, as well as pediatric training in India and Delhi. And then he moved to UK where he worked in Edinburgh, completed his MRCP, then did his fellowship in St. Louis. And he's actually the founding member of the Newborn Brain Society. He's currently professor of pediatrics and director division of neonatal perinatal medicine at St. Louis University. His role today will be like, uh, I mean, uh, holding us together. So he'll have a kind of uh, role where he introduces the moderators. And uh, for sake of time, we have taken a conscious decision to keep the introductions to brief ones. So we spend more time on the academic part as well. So over to you, Professor Mathur, and thank you for all your support. Uh, a good day, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for the kind introduction. Um, I actually have the, the unique privilege of um, having trained with Dr. Ramji. So it's great to see him uh, almost 35 years ago um, at Sabdurjang Hospital. Uh, but I also have had the privilege of collaborating and working with a number of, of speakers today. And I really want to thank them uh, and acknowledge the, the time zones uh, that we're spanning our speakers. So Dr. Anderson in Melbourne, it's midnight for him, but he's agreed to speak. Uh, the, uh, the rest of the speakers are in the US and, and Europe. So I'm not gonna stay any longer between our speakers and, um, and, and the audience. Uh, I think we already have over uh, about 600 participants online. So I'm gonna stop and uh, hand it back to you, uh, Dr. Sridhar. Actually, I, I, I'm gonna introduce the first moderator. Uh, so we've had a slight change in the program lineup. Uh, instead of Dr. Anderson, it'll be Dr. Terry Inder, who will be uh, starting uh, our series, followed by Dr. Anderson. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, the moderator for this session, Dr. Junaid Khan. Uh, who is the Director of Medical Education uh, and Director of the Pediatric Residency Program uh, and a Senior Consultant in Neonatology with uh, Adjunct Faculty Appointment at Khalifa University and Mayo Clinic in the U.S. So over to you, Dr. Junaid Khan. Hey, uh, thank you, Amit. Thank you very much uh, for a kind introduction. Uh, so I, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Terry Andrew. Uh, she's a dual boarded uh, newborn medicine physician and the child neurologist. Uh, she is taking the clinical service, so she is intensivist. Uh, so don't worry about that. She's not only the neurologist, but the neonatologist also. Uh, her research mainly uh, 
about the high risk uh, brain injuries in the high risk uh, infants and they are using uh, all kind of a technologies one which is very close to me also the nirs the near infrared spectroscopy and uh, electroencephalography and mri uh, she moved to uh, get a new role uh, in 2013 as a chair of the new department of the pediatric newborn medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in the Boston, where she is working now. Her main uh, targeted and research is, is the timing, mechanism, and impact of the cerebral injury and altered cerebral development in the human infant. So, right. Uh, physician, right doctor for the right topic, which is the uh, preterm brain injury. Over to you. I, I must say, I cannot say the podium over to you, but the virtual screen over to you, Dr. Inder. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you so much for the capacity to be able to be here this morning with you and present. And I, I do apologize for the slight change in the order, but I'm very grateful to Dr. Mathur and to all of you for the privilege of being here this morning. My topic uh, isn't small, as you know, brain injury in the preterm infant. So off we go. Uh, we know the types of small babies that we are caring for. And as you will hear from one of the uh, speakers today, the outcomes of our preterm infants remain challenged. And these are very broad numbers that I know Dr. Anderson will do a much more elegant job of taking you through. But Although many of our children now don't suffer from significant cerebral palsy, many still have clumsiness, require extra help in school, and have a high risk of some uh, behavioral challenges throughout their childhood years. So why? That's what I'm gonna focus on. Why do these children face these challenges in terms of their motor, cognitive, and behavioral and language development? There are two big areas and we're going to focus on the upper one, which is brain injury. I will briefly touch on the fact that that's not the whole answer. But when we think about brain injury, what are we talking about? And there are three main forms of brain injury we'll focus on this morning. Intraventricular hemorrhage, cerebellar hemorrhage and white matter injury. When we think about intraventricular hemorrhage, we know that it is graded traditionally in this, uh, no, this nomenclature with numbering where grade one relates just to hemorrhage within the fragile capillary network in the germinal matrix zone that lies within the cordothalamic groove. And that there is by definition, no intraventricular blood as the hemorrhage remains contained within the germinal matrix. At grade two and three, this can be somewhat difficult sometimes to distinguish on the upper panel here is grade two, where there is now blood within the ventricle, but either without significant dilatation or with the amount of blood occupying only a small amount of the space in the ventricle. Whereas grade three typically has dilatation and a lot of hemorrhage occupying the space. The so-called grade four is really not about the hemorrhage in the ventricle. It is about a complication that occurs with a venous hemorrhagic infarction, where you can see here that what occurs with a lot of blood in the ventricle is occlusion of the terminal vein with rupture of these medullary veins causing a venous hemorrhagic infarction. Why is it important? Because it's still common. And in fact, it's unfortunate that really we've made very little progress in this disease over the last decade. This is data from the Vermont Oxford Network over a period of 10 years. And you can see that for infants less than 1500 grams, the rates overall are pretty static at 25%, with only 10% of that accounted for by this lower grade one, and the rest being accounted for by higher grades. This was also shown in the neonatal research network where they looked at high grade hemorrhages here in close to 35,000 infants over a period of close to two decades and showed that despite the fact that our treatments have changed, more antenatal steroids, less invasive resuscitation, that our rates of severe intracranial hemorrhage have remained relatively static. Why is this and what causes this disease? 
what causes this risk of injury? Well, there are some factors we can't influence. And we'll talk about this, the more immature you are, the more you are vulnerable to this disease because of the vascular immaturity. If there's been uh, risk factors prior to delivery, particularly maternal inflammation, or anything that may require you to have a lot of extra resuscitation around birth that has put you at risk of really a form of perinatal asphyxia in the preterm, often we can't influence that. But these other factors in red, particularly around cardiorespiratory stability and metabolic stability, we can influence. And these things lead to a risk of intraventricular hemorrhage. We know the immaturity of the germinal matrix is a major risk factor. The germinal matrix itself exists as the source of neural progenitors from around 10 to 20 weeks and then becomes a supplier of both oligodendroglial, the sort of myelin wrapping um, precursors we'll talk about a little bit more, and GABAergic neurons. Its maximal size is around 22 to 23 weeks, and then it starts to regress to fully involute by term. And it's a very delicate area of blood vessels. It's very prone to rupture, and it sits in an area that's a relative watershed in the immature brain. Vascular factors are really key to the etiology of this disorder in two ways. First of all, that the immature brain has very little ability to auto-regulate. And so whatever changes in systemic blood pressure are happening, the brain may see that and will see this. On top of that, we know that the brain is both vulnerable to both decreases and increases in cerebral blood flow and that many of the factors that happen in normal neonatal intensive care, particularly in the first few days of life, influence this both vulnerability to ischemia and reperfusion injury. And that's shown here in a schema that Dr. Volpe and I tried to put together for his last version of the book. You can see on the very left, this time sequence of the first phase being more of an ischemic phase the second phase being more of a reperfusion. The first phase being characterized by these cardiorespiratory factors that often we can't see that lead to decreased cardiac output, to impaired venous drainage, and to ventilatory instability, leading to poor perfusion of the brain and relative ischemia to this poor germinal matrix. However, we do see some things on our measurements. And because of that, we often intervene. And some of those interventions may be the factors that lead to unfortunate reperfusion injury, and then the rupture of the germinal matrix occurring in that first 72 hours of life. There's data to support this, and this is beautiful data that the lead uh, person of this session, Dr. Mathur, with one of his key mentees, Zachary Vesulius, undertook with many, many measurements using neuroinfrared spectroscopy in immature infants, showing, as you can see here, this dark line being the severe IVH, showing compared to the light gray line, both undershooting in this first 40 hours and then overshooting of what the infants who did not have IVH. In other words, the infants with severe IVH spent more time both below and above what we would think of as appropriate mean arterial blood pressures. This is uh, made worse by the fact that many of the infants uh, will have impaired ability to buffer these mean arterial blood pressures and the impact on their brain. And you can see here on the top panel that of an infant with IVH, below that with an infant without. And you can see how the brain, in terms of the blue, in terms of cerebral oxygenation, is seeing all of the changes in the mean arterial blood pressure, unable to buffer those changes in any way. This aligns with the timeline for intraventricular hemorrhage in that we know that about half of this is visible on day one, and most of this will occur within the first 72 hours of life, where it's pretty rare to see new hemorrhage after that time, although of course the hemorrhages can extend. The maximal extent of IVH is usually present by day five. We minimally do an ultrasound on day one, three, and between five and seven days. And this helps us to understand, particularly on the first day of life, 
did this intraventricular hemorrhage occur around the immediate perinatal time and should we be looking at our delivery room and our prenatal management or did this occur in, not then on day one but sometime after day one and should we be looking much more focused on the first 48, 72 hours of the neonatal management. And certainly other groups such as Dr. DeVries, who's led so much of this work, will tell you that doing the ultrasound every day will give you even more information. The neurological consequences of IVH extend more than just the blood. Obviously, the destruction of the germinal matrix has impact. The blood can impact the white matter and the cerebellum. And in terms of the outcome, we know that two key complications moderate a lot of the neurodevelopmental consequences. That is the, the likelihood that you will have this venous infarction and the likelihood you may develop hydrocephalus. So you can see here, when you think about this hemorrhage, it's not just the presence of this blood that is the problem. It's the fact you've destroyed the germinal matrix the blood itself activates a lot of other uh, aggressive reactions within the brain that have impact on the white matter. And indeed, if the blood goes down around the cerebellum, you'll also see external effects on the external granular layer of the cerebellum. The outcomes of these babies um, do uh, vary depending on the severity, obviously, of the hemorrhage. The more milder forms of hemorrhage, as you can see here, the grade one, appear to have less impact, obviously, than the higher grade three and four. And the way I try to think about it is grade one really probably doesn't have direct impact except it mediate impaired neurogenesis in the most immature of infants. Grade two does increase the risk of disability, and part of this is that we are a little bit poor at delineating how much blood is in that ventricle and what impact that blood may be having in all regions of the brain. Mortality clearly increases as the, the grade increases. And what I'd like you to think of is that grade three and four really have actually pretty similar profiles and that what you're looking at is the size of that venous stroke and the amount of hydrocephalus or ventricular dilatation. Remember that the amount of intraventricular blood will occlude that draining vein and lead to this risk of the secondary complication of this venous congestion infarction, that the outcome really relates to how big that um, hemorrhage is. And this is data that shows that when the hemorrhage is extensive, even if it's unilateral, that the chances of, of dying or of major motor or cognitive defects are much, much higher than if the hemorrhage is localized. And this was most beautifully shown by the largest series that was published by another speaker today, Dr. DeVries, who's contributed so much in this area, showing that really for infants who survived, when the hemorrhage was focal within the parietal area, which is by far the commonest area, and if these infants survived, of which approximately 70% uh, or 60% did, then the chances of adverse outcome were really restricted to the motor um, domain, and they were predominantly restricted to unilateral spastic cerebral palsy, of which a significant amount was mild. So you really have to be careful when people start talking about the prognosis related to this so-called grade four and think of it very much as a stroke lesion, a venous stroke, and think of the outcomes in terms of the size of the stroke, the area of the brain that's involved and the impact. The other complication that modifies outcome is post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation. If there is any ventricular hemorrhage, interventricular hemorrhage, the chances the ventricles may dilate is about 50%. If you do get this slowly progressive uh, ventricular dilatation that occurs in about half of the cases that dilate, about half of those you will be thinking about some form of intervention. So if you take overall all of the babies that may have interventricular blood, around 15% or so at least, you will be struggling with the decisions of whether to intervene. 
it doesn't matter, as I've said, whether it's grade three or grade four hemorrhages uh, in terms of the frequency of this condition. And that is significantly, obviously, more common than if you had the lower grade one or two. How do you manage this condition? And we don't have time today to discuss this, but I would refer you to this review article that I had the privilege of working with uh, Linda DeVries on that looks a lot at the measurements of the ventricles which need to be undertaken and systematically followed. Because we know, and this was work that Dr. Mathur contributed to, that the larger the ventricles get, the worse the outcome for the baby. So you can see here on the lower axis that these are the measurements from the ultrasound that were the maximal measurements for the babies while they were in the neonatal unit associated with their two-year outcomes. The bigger those ventricles get, the worse the babies will do. And this again has been shown now in the randomized controlled trial that was beautifully done by Dr. DeVries and other comparative work across North America, leading to recommendations that one should be monitoring these measurements in any baby with intraventricular blood, plotting them at least two to three times a week, and then making decisions about depending on which zone the baby lies in as to what the next steps may be, considering a lumbar puncture and when to consider that, considering neurosurgical interventions with a temporizing measure, such as a reservoir or a subgaleal shunt. The other form of brain injuries that we'll briefly touch on are that of cerebellar hemorrhage, which is often missed on cranial ultrasound, particularly if it's small, compared to routine MRI studies, which more commonly detect these hemorrhages in around 15 to 20% of infants. What has been shown on the Cochrane uh, analysis or the meta-analysis of this is that particularly for those larger hemorrhages, that they are associated with both motor and cognitive impairment. The commonest type of injury seen in the preterm infant is that of white matter injury, and it can be very commonly seen to be mild with a couple of little punctate scars, as you can see on the far left, moving up in grade to linear scars, or now rare, fortunately, the severe cysts. Why does the white matter get so commonly injured? It's because the white matter is maturing rapidly from that very immature neural stem cell. It produces this very vulnerable cell called the oligodendroglia, which is destined to form a complex cell after it goes through its pre-oligodendroglial stage to produce myelin, which is initially immature and then mature later in life. This pre-oligodendroglia is extremely sensitive little soul in the immature brain and is present in the immature brain between about 24 weeks of postmenstrual age and 32 weeks. There are two major mediators of white matter injury, ischemia and reperfusion with a similar vulnerability to IVH and inflammatory mediated injury is also important here, particularly perinatal sepsis, postnatal sepsis, and necrotizing enterocolitis. Both white matter injury and intraventricular hemorrhage when they are high grade as shown, really do have a detrimental effect, particularly on motor development. But as Peter Anderson has shown beautifully, it's more than just motor development. And this is the association between white matter abnormalities. At the time the baby leaves the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, and school-aged outcomes. And you can see that both moderate to severe and even mild white matter abnormalities as shown have an impact on many different academic performances, as you can see. You can also see in this particular slide that it's not just the white matter injury, but also abnormalities that were seen in the deep nuclear gray matter and the cerebellum. And when we think about white matter abnormalities, it's important as Dr. Volpe has very beautifully described many times that when you injure the white matter, you're not only injuring this local area of the brain as shown here in yellow, but you're injuring everything it's connected to. So you can see when you put that big yellow blob over the other side, that that connection, that cable is going from the thalamus all the way up to the cortex and connecting between the hemispheres. And when you cause injury in this area, 
you will cause up and downstream effects on the connections to those critical neurons and the way they function. In addition, as you can see, those migrating cells that were going to come from that germinal eminence are also uh, further affected. So briefly, how can we move forward? We've got this disease injury that's so common. We haven't made any impact in it. How would we move forward now to try and improve the outcomes for our babies? How could we prevent injury? Well, as I've said, I believe a lot of this now comes down to ischemic reperfusion injury. And there is some data to try and help us. We need to be able to look to what period the brain is most likely to go through this, and it appears to be the first 72 hours of life. I do believe that brain monitoring will be essential, but if we can closely monitor all aspects of the care that we are giving, including blood pressure, cerebral perfusion, ventilation, CO2, fluid status, prevent any fluctuations. That needs to begin prenatally with steroids, continue in the delivery room with delayed cord clamping, and appropriate resuscitation. And in the NICU, care around the time of surfactant administration, which has a dramatic cardiorespiratory impact and blood pressure management. A beautiful study again led out by Linda DeVries looked at a nursing intervention in 561 preterm infants. And what they did was compare both pre and post the intervention. This intervention tried to minimize these fluxes by maintaining a central headline position, tilting the incubator and avoiding the head going down or sudden elevation of the legs and avoiding rapid flushes or rapid withdrawals of blood. They did this starting after birth for at least the first 72 hours of life. And look what they showed, a dramatic reduction in new or progressive severe IVH or cystic PVL. How else can we reduce brain injury? Monitoring, and again, this beautiful review by Zach Vesulius looks at the complexity around being able to monitor cerebral perfusion and oxygenation. But we know when we do monitor that we can see differences. And again, this is one study looking at intraventricular hemorrhage associated with these measurements. And you can see that the black boxes are the infants with IVH, they had lower cerebral oxygenation and they had higher extraction. They were needing that oxygen to the brain and they weren't getting it. Again, if we're gonna try and untangle and measure what we need to do as clinicians at the bedside, we need more information. And to get that information, we really are gonna to have to start to untangle modern hemodynamics with more diagnostic certainty than we've had. And this has been the work of targeted ECHO for many years to try and give us less diagnostic uncertainty so that we can use our therapies more judiciously around hypotension, the duct and ventilation. Are there other treatments coming? For decades now, we have been looking at the mechanisms of inflammation, oxidant stress and glutamate excitotoxic injury to try and reduce uh, the cascade of injury in the preterm brain. And unfortunately, there is no silver bullet here, and we are yet to find something that has made a dramatic impact. We can also consider, though, that we can improve outcomes if we do indeed have injury. And I would, you know, make sure that we all consider rehabilitation as an important part of the type of care that we can still provide to our infants, both within the NICU and after discharge. And indeed, we know that injury has a particular impact on motor outcomes and that physical therapy directed in the NICU may be particularly helpful, particularly if it engages the family to be able to continue with these treatments after discharge. Finally, I'll just say that there's other things happening in the preterm brain apart from injury that we still have to be mindful of to improve outcomes. And we know when we have studied it, and again, this is the beautiful work that's been done by Peter Anderson and his beautiful cohort in Melbourne, looking at the differences between infants without brain injury and those who are born full term. And you can see systematic differences in the development, particularly around the temporal lobe and the dorsal prefrontal cortex that are not related to injury, 
but probably related to the many experiences and exposures that our infants have that are so different from what they were meant to have. So in terms of improving outcomes, injury is a big factor. And you can see here, it's really in dark red and it is critical in this first 72 hours of life. And I think the keys are going to be our ability to monitor the brain, to have more insight into cerebrovascular physiology and overall cardiorespiratory physiology to target our treatments and potentially also to have targeted elements of neuroinflammation. This is part of a spectrum of improving outcomes that, as I say, I don't wish to forget about the importance of brain development in the NICU exposures and the time after discharge. But today, I hope you can take away the brain injury remains very common in the preterm infant with rates of between 20 to 50% when you combine IVH, cerebellar hemorrhage and white matter injury. Greater immaturity equals greater risk, but more mature preterm infants also remain vulnerable, particularly for white matter injury. Most injury is occurring during the greatest time of cardiorespiratory instability in the first 72 hours of life. And we really now have to frame shift our knowledge and this is going to require information. We are not voyeurs. We cannot see inside a skull and a baby to understand these things without using technology to assist us. And if brain injury does occur in your babies, please use the words neuro rehabilitation or rehabilitation for them, just as you would at any other time of life. This requires a team approach. We as a discipline, we as a NICU, we as a group of providers are going to have to own the fact that our brain injury rates are high and have not improved. We're going to have to learn how to use these monitoring techniques. We're going to have to learn about how we can improve our outcomes and take a multidisciplinary task force approach to make a difference. And with that, I thank you for your attention and would be happy to take any questions that I may be able to answer. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Andrew. Thank you very much. It's a very nice uh, covering uh, all the topics. We have a few questions and then uh, we will uh, continue with our uh, discussion. One question is uh, from the audience is brain injury in preterms with uh, severe IEGR is any difference? That's a very good question. And what we have found in the severe IUGR infants anecdotally, and I would love to have other uh, speakers speak to this, but, you know, these infants are often stressed in utero, and they tend to almost um, prematurely mature some of their uh, responses or dismature them. Um, so if anything, although they may be vulnerable to the cardiorespiratory instability, particularly their respiratory disease can be extraordinarily difficult to manage. Uh, in those early early hours or days, the risk of brain injury doesn't necessarily go along with that to the same extent. So this, this sort of vasculature may have had that extra maturation to have prevented uh, as much severe impact. Having said that, I think there are other consequences of their severe growth restriction on their long-term outcomes that may offset that, unfortunately. But they have not been well published as a subset of preterm infants that I'm aware of. Sure. Uh, the an another question is about the outcome of cerebellar hematomas. So cerebellar hemorrhage is a very interesting topic. And indeed, um, another speaker on here, Dr. DeVries has published beautifully on this too. And it's been our experience as well. These large hemorrhages uh, are the ones that have the greatest impact on later outcomes. Uh, they are very commonly concurrent with intraventricular hemorrhage. So if we see a very, and they are much commoner in the more immature infants, less than 27 weeks gestation uh, at birth. So if you have a small baby um, who has a significant intraventricular hemorrhage, you should be looking very carefully at the cerebellar area because often it will co-bed with a significant cerebellar hemorrhage as well, because the mechanisms are very similar. These larger hemorrhages uh, also are associated with increased risk of motor and cognitive, and for us in particular, language 
uh, risk and autism risk has also been the thing that has been observed. Yeah. So uh, the smaller hemorrhages that occur <clears throat> in the germinal matrix of the cerebellum, similar to small germinal matrix hemorrhages supratentorially, <clears throat> do not appear to have as much impact um, on the baby, and mainly because these are right externally on the cerebellum. Okay, so um, I, there is a couple of questions. I am actually trying to make it one question regarding the um, post hemorrhagic uh, ventricular dilatation. Okay, so first thing, uh, you are using the ventricular index and how often uh, you are doing the ultrasound or tapping. Uh, let's say if you don't put the reservoir, then how often, because there are chances of infection also there. Yeah, so again, there's a, a better expert than I on this um, panel to be able to speak to this, but our experience and everything mm -hmm. you will find beautifully summarized in that review article in mm -hmm. terms of the guidelines you should consider for your unit. Uh, what we would say is that if the baby has intraventricular blood, we automatically begin monitoring three times a week. So every second day, we measure all of the ventricular measurements. We measure the anterior horn width, the ventricular index, and the occipital diameter. They are plotted. We have uh, in that article an online graph that you can go to, and you can use that to plot. And if we see that the measurements are increasing, then we consult with neurosurgery early to be able to at least begin the discussion about the timing of when we would trial a period of lumbar punctures first. We would do at least two or three lumbar punctures as temporizing measures to see if these would intercept the progressive nature. And then if that does not work, then we would be considering the insertion of either a reservoir or a subgaleal shunt. And this approach, as was shown in the ALVA study, is associated with a dramatic improvement in terms of the fact that the children in that study, their IQs were in the 90s. In the North American studies, where we wait and wait yeah. and watch and scratch and mm -hmm. will not engage, the IQs are often in the 60s or 70s. Mm -hmm. It's very, very sad that we could be making a difference exactly. to these children. Infection rates are low if you are systematic about the way that you undertake all of the surgical interventions and the drainage of the reservoirs. Yeah, uh, there's an interesting question that what is the connection between white matter injury and the severe uh, post hemorrhagic dilatation? That's a very good question. And we do believe that the, um, the stretching of the immature cables with the um, presence of the, the hemosiderin in the blood, the iron, together cause a lot of further injury to the white matter. And indeed, these children with post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus do have significant injury to the white matter. Okay. Uh, also, there's a lot of question about the timing, if it is happening early or the late. So the, for example, there is a question about early onset hemorrhage and the late onset hemorrhage. Is there any difference in, in the outcome? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question because a lot of the impact of the hemorrhage is related to these complications. So the size of the hemorrhage and the complications that are mediating the outcomes and also the level of maturation of the baby at the time of the hemorrhage. In our experience, late hemorrhages are rare. They really only occur with infants who've had a massive cardiorespiratory collapse or overwhelming sepsis and hemodynamic instability associated with that. The period of IVH in most people's hands is dramatically this first 72 hours of life. So uh, because uh, we have an audience from all over the world almost and uh, uh, there are the questions, uh, one or two questions from the low income resource countries that this, uh, they are asking that we have uh, not that expensive tools like NERS, AED or uh, antidal CO2. Uh, is there any cheaper tool to monitoring the brain injuries satisfactorily? Yeah, I mean, I think that things that you can do in low income settings uh, follow the guidelines that are coming through from for instance, this bundle that yeah. showed that head position, avoiding withdrawing and flushing, um, you know, 
read and take the information that is given from these people who are able to monitor and guide practice, delayed cord clamping, these simple measures that have been shown to, to improve cerebral perfusion. If you could apply those and continue to learn from those as we and others, particularly people like Dr. DeVries, Dr. Mathur on this, try to develop uh, me measures and methods that can be applied no matter where you are in the world. Yeah, I think this IVH care bundle, if they follow this, uh, it, it, it helps a lot. It, only the positioning and how to take the blood from the UAC and, you know, uh, because of the cerebral autoregulation. Um, there's one- and Monitoring CO2 as best you can, even if you don't right. have in title. Exactly, exactly. So now uh, back to the monitoring, uh, you, uh, specifically uh, said in your thing that you are using the NIRS also. So, so you start uh, monitoring from the day one of the life? Uh, yes, we start monitoring. Babies? We start monitoring straight after delivery once the baby is stabilized with the central lines and usually, and we will monitor right through uh, the first four, four days of life at least. Our nurses place the near infrared monitor on just as they would place other electrodes on the baby. There's one uh, question which is a lot of controversies in um, our setting and also uh, when I was in the US also, that to do the ultrasound in a very sick or very uh, premature baby at day one, um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, some people do, some people don't. So what do you think about that, that uh, it is uh, mandatory to do the day one or two? We can um, carry on to day three and then we will do the first ultrasound of the head? I actually strongly believe it's very important. And mm -hmm. we just wrote um, an article on neuroimaging with Dr. DeVries actually in the premature infant. And one of the letters we had back stated that you know, most of this hemorrhage has occurred by the time you do the first ultrasound. And our point was that you don't know when it may be occurring. So you don't know where to put your energy. If yeah. really, as, as these uh, authors noted, most of the hemorrhage is occurring by 12 hours of life. If you are seeing most of your hemorrhage by then, you need to look at your prenatal and delivery room care because something is happening in those babies for us, that is not the situation in Boston. Most of our first ultrasounds at, in the first 12 hours do not show major hemorrhage. Our yeah. major hemorrhages are occurring between 12 and 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And that means it's in our hands. It's in the neonatologist's hands that we need yeah. to focus our energy. So I believe it's very, very important. And I think people often say we don't want to handle the babies. The same with the targeted echo. I think you need to look at who is doing the ultrasounds. You can do yeah. these very gently, very easily with minimal handling of the baby. Yeah, to, to me also, if the baby is ventilated, I think it's a very uh, uh, important to do the ultrasound early as much as possible. But if the baby is on non-invasive ventilation and the big, uh, that I don't know, but I, anyway, there's a similar question about uh, the head circumference, orofacial circumference. Uh, is a useful indicator or is a fruit this, test uh, thing? Yeah, certainly it, it's challenging, particularly when the babies have got CPAP hats and all of mm. that. And there is a lot of handling that goes yeah. on to get. I personally find feeling the sutures are uh, just as helpful uh, mm. in terms of knowing whether there may be significant change.